Hello and welcome to Advanced Retro Adaptics. This is Tyler Disney. In this episode, I had a wonderful conversation with Chris Knighton. So Chris is 34 years old. He and his family are halfway to financially independent, but they're at the point where they're starting to wonder, does that even mean anything? So recently, Chris turned his side hustle of a running coach business into a full hustle, quit his job because they wanted him to come back to the office. We talk about how he... Uh, dropped out of an electrical engineering career, how he hiked the Appalachian Trail, how he hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in 99 days. Um, we talk about activism and we talk about the relationship between meaningful work and frugality and um, having a family and uh, you know what, what it means like to look normal but not necessarily to be normal. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Chris Knighton. You're 34 now. It's 2023. And I know that you quit your electrical engineering degree in 2011 yep. because you were disillusioned. Yep. I'm doing math. Here. You were like 22. Yeah, I didn't make it very, very <laughs> long. <laughs> so I graduated college in 2011 um, with a degree in electrical engineering and minor in mechanical engineering. I went to college in Boston at Northeastern University. And I got my first job right out of college working for a, she would call it a general, general engineering contractor. They did a lot of municipal and government type projects. And I was one of their electrical engineers who would do the electrical specifications for larger uh, infrastructure. My company would build things like wastewater treatment facilities. Um, they would do road work type projects. They would build office buildings and other public works type projects as well. Um, but I became disillusioned in it pretty quickly. This was something that definitely started while I was still in college. I pretty quickly learned probably around the age of 19 or so when I was still in college that this it wasn't going to be a path that I wanted to stay on mm. very long. Because I, I struggled to find any sense of, it just wasn't, it, well, it wasn't rewarding for me. I didn't really get much personal satisfaction from it. But I also felt like what I was trying to achieve through engineering, which was helping the world in some way or helping people in some way, doing it through cor a corporate engineering job just seemed, what, what would be the word? Like a farce. Like even... Even when I would apply for jobs at companies that were doing, let's say, environmental type engineering projects, I, I did solar design, for example. Um, I worked on wastewater treatment facilities. I did, I even did some community parks, you know, which I love <laughs> parks and cities, yeah. but it all just seemed fake. Like it wasn't. The stuff that I was doing wasn't bettering the world in a way that I wanted to with my work. Uh, it was just kind of perpetuating the status quo. Did you have a vision for what that would look like? Or was it a sort of like, I'll know it when I see it and I don't see it? Yeah. I mean, when I was in college, that was really like it is for most people. I think a very coming of age time for me. It's where I kind of discovered my values what was important to me. And I mentioned this in an email to you. Um, you had said that you were somewhat involved with the, the Occupy movement in uh, California. And when I was in college, I got involved with various radical leftist politic groups. Um, I did a lot of work for um, advocacy for the homeless and uh, did a lot of environmental activism as well. I also, at that time, I guess this is somewhat related, um, I became vegan. And so that kind of became part of my identity as well from an ethical perspective. Sure. You know, I really wanted to just live a life that I thought um, was in line with what I thought was good and right. And any work that I did, you know, I wanted to be furthering the causes that I believed in. As I started to understand the way the world works and know more about it, I realized that the type of work that you would do in, let's say, a corporate engineering role, even if it's going to, on the surface, 
seem like it's a good thing. Like, you know, I put, I did solar design for the top of, you know, a large building for, for a town, a town facility. So that seems good. Yeah. There's just like, there's so much stuff involved with that. That's not in line with my values that by the time you get to the end product of like, yeah, sure. There's like solar panels on the roof of this building. I just feel like at what cost did it take to even get to that point? Um, how much, you know, well, we, we can get into this, but like, it, ju- it just wasn't rewarding. Like, <laughs> yeah, it just made me question if it's like, is any of this stuff really helping at all? Um, when the fact that like, yeah, sure. We put like solar panels on this building, but like, you know, my boss is driving around in like a truck he doesn't need. Like I'm, you know, like no one's living the lifestyle on a day-to-day business the day-to-day basis that's like moving in the direction, moving like your life and the world in the direction you want to be. You're just kind of doing these like token projects that are like supposedly helping the world and community. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. It's like, it's like, okay, the structure of everything that is here is not something I'm into. And then we're just like adding something that sounds good on paper on top of this thing, but we're not actually addressing like the structure beneath it absolutely i had an internship when i was in college at a company called groom energy solutions and um, for a young engineer you know who was interested in energy efficiency and renewable energy working for a company called energy solutions sounds awesome like that's exactly what i wanted to do and it's like yeah all their pro all their projects were like retrofitting lighting making them more energy efficient um you know, replacing different types of mechanical equipment in buildings to make them more energy efficient. But like, I mean, it's good and it's fine. And I think maybe if I was passionate about that, the actual work, it could have been fine. But I remember this conversation or overhearing a conversation once with the CEO of my company who was talking to somebody on the phone. And I don't even know what they were talking about, but I just remember him saying like on the phone, yeah, we're called Groom Energy Solutions, but like, I never said that like we're a sustainable company. You oh. know, like we're not, we're not trying to do this, that, and the other thing. It's like we're just trying to do the thing we're doing. And I totally get it. <laughs> you know, now as a business owner, I know what it's like to run a business, and there's certain things maybe you sometimes need to do. But mm. um, I just became very disillusioned with the whole greater green engineering and renewable energy space. So I quit my I quit my formal engineering job in 2013 and left left well there was a lot of stress involved too so I won't just say it was because of you know not liking what I was doing which was true it was also incredible I found it incredibly stressful yeah. to go to the office every day to be in an environment I didn't enjoy to be surrounded by people who I saw what my future would be if I stayed at that company and you know, my, my manager was a guy who was there for like 30 years. And it, I was just like, I don't want to be this guy. Like, I don't want this to be my life, you know, 30 years from now doing the same thing, maybe just managing some younger kids. <laughs> but I was under a lot of stress too, with just the job. And so I quit and I left and I, I went to go hike the Appalachian trail. And that was kind of my first foray into living the life that I wanted to live. Mm. I have questions about that. So the, the, I think you, you may have already answered my question because that makes a little bit more sense. But the question is, what uh, what circumstances did you have at that point that made you think that quitting your job and like walking for five months or how long the AT takes, that it wasn't going to be a catastrophe? Like, how could you afford that? Like, what was your sort of safety net that allowed you to say, right, F this, I'm out of here. Yeah. Time. You know, I was never worried about it. I've never felt reliant on needing to have a job for my own security. You know, I've always felt like I could figure it out and I'd be okay. You know, I think in a lot of ways I was lucky early on as a kid. I never I never really developed much of a materialistic mindset. I've never felt the need for for much beyond just basic conditions of life to make me happy, you know, a place to live and, you know, some fun things to do and some friends, you know, food. (laughs) Don't feel like I need that much. 
Yeah. So when I actually, this kind of goes back to when I was in college, I was, I realized probably when I was about a sophomore in college, maybe about 18 or 19, that I didn't want to stay on this career trajectory. But at that point, I was already in pretty good college debt. You know, I probably had $30,000 in debt for my first year of college. And I was like, shit, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to pay this off. So I remember when I was younger, like, sophomore in college thinking, Hey, do I change majors? Do I pursue something that's more in line with my interests and values? Or do I, you know, just quit college? But, you know, I was like, engineering pays well, it can pay well, might as well just see this through, get a job, you know, pay down my debt. And um, that was kind of my mission from, I guess, the age of like 19 to 23. It was, you know, I don't, it was like, Hey, I don't like engineering. I don't really want to be an engineer. But by the time I graduated, I had, I don't remember exactly 40 to 60,000 in debt probably. And it was just like, Hey, let's pay this off as soon as Mm. possible to get my freedom back. Mm. And then I can figure out what I want to do with my life. So you did that before you quit. You paid off your, your loans before you quit. Yeah. So all through college, I lived so frugally. You know, I dumpster toe for food. I, uh, you know, hung out with friends that just, you know, lived kind mm-hmm. of a super frugal lifestyle. I, uh, you know, hardly spent anything, you know, worked some good internships through college to help pay as I went. And then when I graduated, it was just like, you know, I'm going to put everything like, I don't know what it was like everything beyond rent <laughs> yeah, towards my debt. And I paid down what it was, I forget, but like 40 to 60,000, something like that. I paid that down in about three years. And like, I literally just had a spreadsheet and it was like, <laughs> as soon as I got the, the, the paycheck every two weeks, it was just like, you put, I don't know, 80% of that or something yeah. to my loans. Yeah. And I had like this date. It's like, when am I going to be free? When am I going to be free? <laughs> and then I remember finally paying off my debt and going out for my lunch break and just going for a walk like I would normally do most days to get the hell out of the office. And um, just thinking like, wow, like, like I'm, I'm free now. Like I, wow. I have no, I have a college degree. I have no debt. I'm 22, 23 mm. at this time. You know, I have no money. I have no net worth. Cause I like, I wasn't, I, I think I was saving like the 401k match, but I wasn't saving yeah. beyond that. It was just like all going to the debt. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I'm back to zero. Hey, zero is better than and, uh, negative a lot. <laughs> but I, yeah, but I felt free and I, I didn't feel like anyone could control me anymore. And, you know, there was times in, in college where I was like, I remember Googling, like, how do you live in a van? Because <laughs> I was like, I was like, I don't know. You know, I just want to live a fun life full of adventure and what I want to do and enjoy it. Like, I don't care. It does, the, I, I don't need to make a lot of money to do that. You know, I'd rather have the freedom over the shackles of having this full-time job that I don't love. Mm. So once I cr- paid off my debt and was, in my mind, free, I worked for probably another, I think it was less than six months, <laughs> just to stockpile some money. Yeah. I think I got, I had about, I think I had about $30,000 if you count what was in my 401k. So I probably had like, I don't know, 20,000 in investments and then like maybe 10,000 in cash. And then I was like, all right, I hate this job. I'm so stressed out. <laughs> I got to go guys. <laughs> um, and yeah. And that was really the beginning of creating the life that I wanted to live from that day forward. Mm. Yeah. I was so happy. So happy to leave that. <laughs> that, that I'm, I'm, uh reflecting on kind of my own own path and uh first of all it sounds like you were just smarter than me but a difference in in our paths is uh when i graduated the company that i found to go work for there in their subtitle was deep green engineering and the president the guy who started founded the company he had been an anti-nuke activist in like the 70s and 80s you know and so it's like it it, it felt very aligned with what I wanted to be doing. And so, you know, I showed up and, and every, almost everyone else there was young 
yeah, I came out of college. A lot of other hires were out of college or just a couple of years out of college. They were young. They were like on the same wavelength values was, you know, we'd go hang out and then we'd go down to the bar. We'd have some drinks. We'd talk about like our dreams for changing the world and all this other stuff. And it was, it was not at all clear that that's not perhaps where I was supposed to be. Maybe it was where I was supposed to be, but um, it's just like, I stuck it out there a lot longer and it didn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't obvious to me that I should be doing something to gain my freedom because I was like, no, this is what I want to be doing. This makes sense. Um, so in some sense, I'm jealous of the fact that your first job was like so clearly uh, <laughs> not in alignment with what you wanted to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got out of it as early as I did, but it was a painful number of years. I mean, I was very stressed. Mm. Um, I Every day, like it was like, office space like going to this such a boring job like i didn't really relate with my coworkers. um i didn't like what i was doing on a daily basis i felt the financial stress of the student debt and Mm. like the need to pay that off Mm. and just like you know i I think this is different than you where you felt like you were living the life you wanted to live and being with the people you wanted to be with i was not and um when I actually came back from the Appalachian Trail and had to get a job again, that's when I tried to find a company where the people were like me and Mm. we had the same values. Um, I don't know if you don't want to get into that now or or a bit later, but um, this is where I worked with people who who were like me and I thought I was doing the the right thing. Um, Okay. And uh, it was okay. (laughs) Okay. So so, uh, so, so you're at E-Corp. You go hike the AT. You just hike the AT. Yeah, I hiked. I hiked the Appalachian Trail. Okay. Um, it was my first time hiking. Really, honestly, I I went backpacking one time before that <laughs> to do like a little practice. Just you know, get us. I, I think I bought all my gear and I went for a one night trip on a local trail in Massachusetts. Um, but yeah, really went out with no no experience really. But you know. T- Tons of people hike the AT with no experience. And I knew that I had, it's, it's a mental thing more than a physical thing. I, I was in fine shape. I was by no means an athlete, but I was, I, I biked every day in Boston. Yeah. I was in good shape. So yeah, I went out, hiked the AT, had, had an amazing time. I, like I said, this was kind of the beginning of creating the life I wanted to live. It was the first, I would say the first time in my adult life where I really felt like free and was doing what I wanted to be doing mm. with my life. What's so cool about hiking a long trail is you get up every day and your life is so simple. You just have really one simple purpose, which is to move forward and advance along the trail. Mm. It's awesome. I, I loved it. It really resonated with me. Met a lot of great people. The types of interactions you have with those you meet are so different than the interactions we have in regular life. You know, I would befriend people three times my age. I was 24 when I hiked it. I, I, one of my best friends, her name was Blue Jay. I met her on the trail. Everyone has a trail name they go by. Yeah. She was like 70. And, you know, we just hung out and hiked and it was just like, you know, we're, we're, everyone's the same on there. And it's like, I don't know. I didn't know what her job was, what her history was. People don't even really talk about that. It's just everyone comes to the trail looking for similar things. And it's it's just like that break from the world, um, an opportunity to just like go into the unknown with this adventure. You don't know what's going to happen. And just it's just fun. It's just it's just a completely different way of life. The worries of home and, you know, you're not thinking about where you're going to get food. You're not thinking about where you're going to make money. You're not thinking about relationships. It's just out there in nature, moving forward, meeting people along the way. It's, I mean, it's really a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. I love it. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of in my entire life, having mm. done it, because so few people can say they've done anything like that or they've even tried. Mm. And um, there were so many hard days. I mean, it's not easy. It, it, 
brains <laughs> a lot. <laughs> it's cold a lot. And physically, it's pretty hard. And so many people don't finish. Like, I don't know where they get this number, but they say like 80% of people quit within the first two weeks because they're like, no, this isn't for me. <laughs> you know, they spend yeah. a couple nights in the tent, it rains the first time, maybe they see a bear or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I loved it. I never want, I would never want to quit. Like I would have kept doing it forever if I could have, but yeah. eventually uh, I finished the hike. My funds were starting to run a little bit low and I had to figure out what was next. So you finished uh, that was, so you, you did the hike in 2013, the, the Appalachian trail in 2014, 2014. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 18, 14. And then you, so you had to go back and get a job. Yeah. Um, you know, at the, at the end of it, I was faced with a dilemma and, and I think part of the whole hike was like, you know, take six months to figure out what am I going to do with my life? Right. Like spend six months on the trail looking for answers to the questions <laughs> of, you know, where do I want to, where do I want to live after this? What do I want to do? Um, you know, I just left a career. I knew I didn't want to go back to it. Um, what's the future going to look like? The unfortunate thing is, um, I didn't necessarily find that, find those answers. <laughs> you know, I, I got some clarity, sure. But when I came back, you know, I had this great experience behind me. I loved it, but yeah, and it was kind of like, uh, now I got to face reality again. Mm. So what's, what's the, what's the reality going to be? What, what's the reality I create going to be though? Because I think one thing that I learned from hiking the AT was that I don't need to play by anyone else's rules mm. if I don't want to. Mm. And I don't, and, and what I learned is that people are actually really good and nice <laughs> everyone who hikes long trails often comes with this experience is they often say like oh it restored my faith in humanity and that's true because you have so many pleasant experiences with others and that strangers help you out and it's just the relationships you have are so much more positive than they tend to be in real life real life um but what it taught me it was like yeah i don't need to I don't need to play by other people's rules anymore unless I want to, you know, I don't need to do the kind of thing I don't want to do anymore. Um, I was like, Hey, I should probably get a job to make money, but it's going to be more on my terms. Like I'm not going to take shit anymore. Yeah. I don't need to at this point. It's like, sure. I have no, I, you know, I only have a few thousand dollars to my name, but it's like, I don't have debt. I'm a young guy. I'm healthy. I'm free. I have a better idea of what I want to do now. It's like, now I'm going to try to do things the way I want to do them. So you, it's funny. You said you, you got involved with a company where their tagline was deep green engineering. Um, I came home and I found a company who's the CEO, the name of his dog, and he proudly advertised this on the company's website. The name of his dog was Katahdin. And for those who don't know, Mount Katahdin is the final mountain on the Appalachian Trail. So I see this and I'm like, okay, Katahdin, the guy who founded this company, it's, an, it's a green um, home energy retrofit company. He had hiked the Appalachian Trail like five years prior. So I see this and I'm like, this is a sign. <laughs> like there's this company run by an Appalachian Trail through hiker, like all through hikers understand each other and he started this company doing home energy retrofits okay i'll apply for this and i'll do this i went in for the interview i met with the guy he was like oh you're a through hiker yeah you're a former engineer yeah you're way over -qual qualified for this job you should come work for us <laughs> um so i did <laughs> and um and that was kind of the beginning of what i would call my the, the second act of my engineering career. Uh, the first act was certainly traditional engineering. I was a real, real engineer. Yeah. The second act, I was an overqualified um, person who, who did stuff that was kind of engineering-like, but uh, stuff that was more in line with my values, but definitely paid a lot less, which kind of sucked, but was way less stressful. But ultimately, I don't do any of that stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, to, to kind of move the story along, though, um, 
I worked for this company. They were called Next Step Living. They made homes more energy efficient through the installation of insulation, new windows, heating and cooling systems, solar mm-hmm. systems. They kind of did everything. And it was cool. I liked it. They actually had a a workforce that, at least on the surface, I really vibed well with. I think kind of like the company you said you worked with, um, you know, everyone kind of was like me. They were all, they were all young, which was a stark difference from my old engineering job where everyone was like twice my age here. Everyone was my age. You know, we had a lot in common, shared interests. We're all trying to better the world, I guess, through our work. There was definitely some challenges with the company. And I think from the leadership side and the direction of where they were going, there was definitely some issues. The, the company ended up going bankrupt. Mm. Um, but I worked there for two years before they went out of business. And um, I don't know, I just kind of coasted along. I didn't really know what I was what I was mm. doing. Um, certainly wasn't saving for financial independence or anything at that point, just kind of like coasting along. It was okay. And we were doing good things. Like I actually did feel kind of like we were living the mission I wanted to live there of of helping people, making homes more energy efficient. We were actually doing that work and I felt good about it. Mm -hmm. Um, The company certainly had issues. (laughs) They ultimately went bankrupt. And when they went bankrupt, I got laid off. And then I went and hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. (laughs) I learned, Tyler, that you, you actually live on the PCT, pretty close to it, and you want to do it in the future. <laughs> yeah, I've got so, my permit. Uh, you got your permit? When are you going? Uh, I'm going on May 30th, my start date. So I'm not doing the whole thing. I'm actually starting here, and I'm probably not going all the way to Canada. I'm actually uh, I've, uh, I'm running an event here in uh, mid-September. Yep. So I've got to get back by then. So I'm going to be on trail for two months, uh, possibly as, as many as three months. Nice. Uh, kind of uh, smell the roses pace. Nice. Because I'm, because I'm not trying to beat, you know, um, the snow and the cascades. So. Gotcha. Um, yeah. From here. So, I mean, I, I've lived like, I, I literally live in the Southern Sierra Nevada mountains and I've done some hiking up and around in here, but I am not that familiar actually with the high Sierras. I've never really been through most of it. I'm like, all right, this needs to change immediately. So, you know, all doing, doing the whole length of the Sierras is, is kind of priority number one. Um, and then, you know, having a good time and learning my, my, my uh, backpacking philosophy to date has been closer to uh, extra heavy as opposed to ultra light. So I'm taking this opportunity to be like, right, that's not going to work. That's terrible. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's get on Reddit. Let's go on the ultralight sub. Let's see what people are doing. Let's let's gain the wisdom from these people and have a better experience <laughs> out there. That's awesome. I'm so excited for you. The the PCT was without a doubt the best like you know personal trip I ever went on. You know, <laughs> I think I think honestly the best things I've ever done in my life. It's like meeting my wife, getting married, having our kid and hiking the PCT. Like those are the best things ever. Things I'm most proud of. Yeah. Things that I'll never forget. Like, uh, I would absolutely do it again in a heartbeat and, uh, you're going to have so much fun. Oh, thanks man. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Now you said you did it in 99 days. Yeah. That's I did quite it quick. I did it pretty quick. So there was a lot of differences between my Appalachian Trail hike and my PCT hike. When I hiked the Appalachian Trail, I actually hiked it with a partner. Um, it was um, the woman who I was dating at the time. Yeah. We're, we're not lo- no longer together, but I did it as a couple's hike. So we were together. Sure. And w- when you hike with another person, you need to, you know, you, you, you do things differently than you would by yourself. Uh, we definitely took it a lot slower than I probably wanted to at times. Um, and we did a lot more socializing, that kind of thing, you know, hanging out, going to town, that kind of stuff along the way. Yeah. Uh, so when we hiked the AT, it took us a good six months. We, you know, we probably only averaged 10 to 15 miles a day. Mm. But when I went to go hike the PCT, I was alone at that point. I, I wasn't with um, that woman anymore. I was by myself. And 
that was the that was like the first big trip I'd gone on solo. Mm. So I just want I just kind of wanted to do it my way. I mean, I was by myself, so obviously I had to do it my way. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't a goal to hike it in a hundred days. It, that's just kind of the rhythm that I fell into. Um, uh-huh. The the PCT is so conducive to hiking quickly compared to the AT. It's such an easier trail from a terrain and technical perspective. Um, you can just get up. You, you just get up in the morning. You hike. And you can cruise like three or four miles an hour if you're a strong hiker huh. all day long. So I would, I think my first day I did 25 miles um, and I rarely did less than 25 miles a day. Um, I did a lot of like 30 mile days, which might seem like a lot, but I mean, you know, if you hike three, three miles an hour for 10 hours, you know, you're hiking it in the summer. The days are pretty long, you know, yeah. I would get up at dawn hike for five hours or something, you know, have a lunch break, ha- hang around for an hour or two, hike for another five hours. It's not um, a lot else to do out there, right? There's no Netflix. There's no, <laughs> there's really not. And, um, for this hike, I, you know, I didn't spend much time in towns. I pretty much was in and out of towns. I think I, I tried to avoid them actually as, as much as possible so I would, I would schedule when you hike these long trails, you need to plan everything around your food carries. Like, you know, where are you going to get your next supply of food? And often you have options, you know, it's like, do you hike two days, then take a bus into town and try to hitchhike? Or do you hike, you know, five days straight, skip over that one town. And then like, there's an easier, uh, maybe a store on the trail, that kind of thing. So like, there's no right way to do it, but you can plan how you want to approach it. And I definitely tried to minimize trips off trail. Um, so I, if there was any kind of a store on the trail or within walking distance, I would plan to go to that, buy my food from that. Um, I would definitely do some longer carries sometimes of food rather than take time getting off. And yeah, I mean, that was kind of my approach and, and I definitely carried a lot less gear on my PCT hike than I did on the AT. And that just makes hiking so much more pleasant um, if you're trying to cover long, long distances. So I never felt burdened by the stuff that I had, which was nice. Um, you said your base weight was like eight to 10 pounds. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, I, I kind of fine tuned it quite a bit over the years from when I started on the AT to doing the PCT and then a little bit beyond that as well. When I first started with the AT, I had no background in hiking, you know, no experience. So, you know, I pretty much went to REI and bought the the stuff that they had for sale at REI. Yeah. And there's plenty of great stuff at a store like that, but mm, it's, I hardly use any of that anymore. I mean, I think I've pretty much replaced all my gear since when I first started for anyone looking into getting into backpacking the best gear is made by like small independent manufacturers and and like these these small companies the the big name stuff that you'd buy at a store like rei generally is going to be really over built over engineered it's going to be a lot heavier than it needs to be um it's probably pretty good durable stuff but you just don't need it really and you're going to end up buying all this stuff that you think you need that ultimately you don't like the number of items I carry in my pack now compared to when I first started hiking, it's probably less than half. (laughs) Um, There's so much stuff you don't need. So yeah. I mean, do you want to get into that? Do you want to talk about what you, yeah, yeah. (laughs) What you carry and how, how you can improve it? I would absolutely love to. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, because, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing my homework, right? And yep. um, it, it's interesting, actually, on previous backpacking trips and things, I haven't been that into the logistics and the planning. Like, I'll do enough to be responsible, mm-hmm. but it's like, I, I never really enjoyed it. And I think part of that was probably just because I was uh, burnt out with work and really mm-hmm. busy with stuff. And now I'm less so. But I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at how much I'm enjoying the logistics, the planning, the research, and mm-hmm. the homework of stuff. Um, but what you were talking about reminded me of the, um, the, there's a lot of aphorisms in the ultralight community, right? And mm-hmm. one of them is don't pack or you will pack your fears, right? Don't pack your fears. 
um, you know, whether that means uh, more insulation than you need, yep. more shelter than you need, a bigger first aid kit than you need, like whatever. So yep. yeah. What's your perspective on that? And like what you've packed and like, what, like maybe some of the surprising things you don't bring. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, this is funny to, I, I, I'm so happy we're talking about this actually, because I haven't <laughs> talked, I haven't thought about this stuff in depth or talked about it much in years. Yeah. Um, I, I've continued to hike since 2016 when I did the PCT, but like man. I've really dialed in my gear and it hasn't changed. It mm. really hasn't changed in what, seven years. And I don't think it probably will anymore in the future. Cause it, I just have it, the stuff now. Yeah. Um, and I know what I like, but I, so yeah, don't pack your fears. Totally. The approach that people take is they, they bring everything they think they might need. I'm not going to say that that's a wrong approach for a beginner because when you're a beginner, yeah, being overprepared is probably a good thing because you, you probably do lack the knowledge and the skills to know what you truly need. Mm. But with anything that I would say maybe isn't safety related, I would say as a beginner, bring, bring like warm layers and first aid kit and stuff like stay safe. Don't bring luxuries at like, don't just bring luxury items at first because you think you are going to need them. Like only add them to your pack. If you find yourself missing it. Um, Mm. And luxuries can be a lot of different things. So (laughs) Um, yeah, it's sort of a different definition for, uh, for long, long hikers, right? <laughs> yeah. So how, how do you best, how do we best talk about this? So some of the things that I don't carry anymore, when I talk about all these things that I don't bring, this is not a sacrifice. I'm actually, mm. I, I'm happy to not bring this stuff and it mm. makes my life easier and simpler. And I enjoy hiking more without these things. Um, I don't bring a stove or any kind of cook kit anymore. That was a huge improvement. Mm. Uh, when I was a new hiker, I had a, like a pocket rocket jet boil thing. Um, I had little fuel canisters. If those fuel canisters, they would only last like a few days and you would always need to be trying to find one. They're kind of hard to find because you had to go to like a specialty store to get one. They're just kind of a pain. You have your pot, you have... Um, maybe like a rag or something to clean the pot. You have the lid for the pot. You have, uh, you have your fork. Um, (laughs) I don't know there's like, there's like 10 items or something that you need to carry just to bring a cook set. And the only things I would cook would be like heat up water for ramen, couscous, mashed potatoes, uh, like soup, And what I realized and learned is you can actually make all those things that I just mentioned with what's called like the cold soaking method. Do you know about that, Tyler? Yeah, I've I've been looking into it. Have you ever tried it? Uh, No, I I, I made some like uh, I made some like oats cold soak the other morning. That's pretty trivial. I haven't done like dinner dinner stuff yet. Yep. So oats. (laughs) Oats is another thing. Um, And these these meals I mentioned, that's primarily what I was eating as a hiker. Um, you replace all the things, the pot, the, the stove, the fuel canister, the stress of trying to find replacement fuel canisters, <laughs> uh, all this stuff, um, with just a, I would just bring a empty plastic peanut butter jar and all these things that I just mentioned, couscous, ramen noodles, oatmeal, uh, dehydrated soup, dehydrated beans. All you need to do is put them in your peanut butter jar put in water, shake it up, wait an hour or so while you hike. And then the stuff just rehydrates and you, you can eat it at, at the ambient temperature. And I know as I described this, like you might be thinking like, well, that doesn't like, I want a warm meal. Um, that sounds horrible. I don't want to eat like, <laughs> like, like cold like mush or hot mush or whatever. <laughs> but what I found is that like, I didn't miss the warmth of the meal at all. Mm. Like when you've been hiking for 10 or 20 or even 30 miles in a day, you're just hungry. And like, you want the starch, you want the carbs, you want the salt. You don't necessarily want the heat. Mm. Um, especially on a trail like the PCT, PCT, it's a warm trail. Like you're, you're in the desert. I mean, you're in the sun all day. Like you don't need a hot meal. Um, and just to get rid of all those 
cook kit items. Yeah. Not only do you save like two to three pounds and a ton of pack space by replacing it with a, you know, one ounce jar, it just makes the process of cooking so much easier. Um, you eliminate you know, cooking, cooking a meal as a backpacker is a process. And when I go on casual weekend trips with friends, like I'll often bring a cook kit because hanging around a campfire and cooking, like that's part of the experience. Yeah. But as a backpacker where your main goal is to travel the land and stuff, it was just, you know, it, you, you free up all this time and all this complexity in your day by not having to stop and cook and, you know, wash out your pod and, um, you don't have this like wet thing you're carrying around and you don't need to do extra trips trying to find fuel. And, um, it's just, it just simplifies your life. And it's one of the best things that I've done for sure. Nice. Some other things like first aid kit, um, <laughs> pretty much did, like I, I, I don't carry a first aid kit anymore. But when I first started, I did, you know, and you buy like this first aid kit from, I don't know, REI or something. It has band-aids and who knows what, like, antiseptic yeah. and gauze and bee sting <laughs> kid. I don't know what's in there. Um, over time, I just whittled it down and whittled it down. Um, it, and now I don't carry anything. Um, and I won't say nothing. Like there's a few things that I carry, but it's a much more, um, it's a, it's a first aid kit based on the skills and experience that I have. So you need to think about like what's what's realistically going to happen to you when you're on the trail and what can you realistically treat yourself so the most common thing that's going to happen is you're going to like you know trip and like scrape your knee or scrape your arm or something you know if you get an abrasion like that or some kind of a cut you don't really need a first aid kit like you just wash off with some water I would always carry hand, like a thing of hand sanitizer to wash my hands after I use the bathroom. You know, just wash off with some water, put some hand sanitizer on it. Yeah, fine. I would carry, you know, I'm always carrying like some toilet paper. So, you know, you can use that as like a bandage. Sure. Like you can dab <laughs> it with some toilet paper, like whatever. It's just a cut. Like it's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, uh, what else is going to happen? Um, you know, if something more serious happens, like you break a bone or you know like go unconscious or so like i don't know in that case you're kind of screwed like, <laughs> <laughs> like what, what's bringing a first like what do you got to do with a first aid kit if you break your boat like you see you got to get out yeah hey, i've got a band-aid well i've got a bone <laughs> sticking out of my leg the I mean, it's not gonna cut it <laughs> so, so like you need to think about what can you actually treat and then like what are the worst case scenarios and how do you handle the worst case scenarios um there's a lot that you can do with like you know, hand sanitizer, water, toilet paper. Um, I, I'll often bring like a few ibuprofen pills, right? Like some kind of minor painkiller, yeah. you know, who, just as like a, who knows what happens kind of thing. Like if your knee really hurts and you need to hike 10 miles to get out of there, it's probably going to be better if you have some ibuprofen and yeah. that takes up no space, but you can essentially carry those things. You know, they take up no space. They don't weigh anything, but then you, I guess you do need to think about like, how are you going to handle worst case situations. And this is something that I think now that I'm a little bit older, I, I probably would approach differently if I were to hike a long trail. Um, in the past, I would just be like, well, I'll be careful and uh, hopefully nothing happens. <laughs> and I think that that's what everyone should do. Cause I mean, there's no way to like self protect yourself from you know, falling off a cliff or getting attacked by a bear or getting bit by a rattlesnake or like, these are risks of hiking the trail. Yeah. Um, but, and often you're hiking in places with no cell phone service. So your cell phone's not going to help you. You may be alone. Um, so there's no one to help you. Um, I think if I was to do a trip like that again, I would probably get one of those GPS alert things. Yeah. Um, especially now that I have a family, uh, sure. you know, wife and kid there, when I hiked the PCT, like it's basically like a walkie talkie and you don't do anything with it, but I think it might've had like a satellite text messaging feature. And then there was like an SOS button that would bring in like a helicopter. <laughs> uh, and I didn't have anything like that when I hiked the PCT, but I think if I was to do something like that again, I would, I would get one of those just for the off chance situation, like every year you hear about it like people do you know whether it's in the sierras or wherever like 
get into bad situations. People do fall off cliffs, break their leg. <laughs> you know, you know, hope it never happens to you, but I yeah. think that's one of the best things you can do is just have a, in the worst case scenario, at least you can press this button and someone will hopefully come yeah. help you. <laughs> well, yeah. And you know, I've, um, so I, uh, I've done a fair amount of uh, rock climbing uh, mm-hmm. and I got into, when I started climbing outdoors more, I got into reading. It's a, uh, oh, I guess the, the title of the publication is uh, Accidents in North American Climbing the Year, you know, and it's just a book that is uh, stories of accounts of accidents that have happened both like near misses, uh, you know, like, oh, this thing happened, but everyone's okay. And ones where people, you know, people aren't okay. And kind of the whole point of the publication is like, learn how, learn from the mistakes of others. So you don't repeat their mistakes. And I think that can be really helpful um, to avoid getting in that situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'd have to look this up, but I, I, I feel like I remember seeing that most falls happen to hikers. It doesn't happen to climbers. Wow. So most, most climbers are, you know, they've got ropes and stuff, Yep. <laughs> but yep. it's, cl- cl- uh, it, it's mostly hikers, you know, either um, hiking on a, a, a section of the trail that's got exposure or, yep. you know, going to a cliff, right. For a photo opportunity or whatever, um, where you kind of get into trouble and there's way more hikers than climbers, but. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it. There, there was a number of experiences that I've had personally hiking um, in, in mountainous regions with exposure usually with snow where yeah. you know you slip and you, you you're on this steep slope and you slide and tumble and people fall really far i've seen it happen uh thankfully the guy was okay but i saw a 60 year old guy when i was on the pct t- pct take a tumble fall probably like 500 feet do like 10 oh. somersaults and then skid out and thankfully he didn't hit any rocks or anything but like oh my god it was terrifying um and you just get into these situations when you're hiking trails like this you never expect it but you kind of like it's kind of like the the frog and hot water situation where like mm. it just it seems okay but it's like getting a little hotter and hotter and hotter mm. and then eventually you realize like oh well I'm in deep. <laughs> We're in a situation you, here. You're kind yeah. of stuck. <laughs> you get good at this stuff though, like with experience and um, fi- like fine tuning what you bring with you and how you handle situations and um, you get good with it and you real, but you need a lot less than you think that you need with the Sierras. When you hike the Sierras or any, any snow area, mountainous area, I think two things that are really important to bring and not to skimp on are like micro spikes for your feet and like a good, good ice ax that you have a, a decent understanding of how to, to use. Um, cause I don't know why I'm, well, I'm harping on the dangerous, but there's very few dangers in hiking, but, um, yeah. hiking in, in exposed snowy areas where you could slip and fall is like, can be very extremely dangerous. Um, so you never want to skimp on like safety gear like that to go ultra light, yeah. but you don't have to, because, uh, you know, you, the stuff you bring is so light because you're only wearing one shirt and one pair of shorts and you have no backup clothes and, uh, you have no stove and no first aid kit and, <laughs> and basically yeah. no other possessions. So <laughs> can afford to bring an ice axe and micro space. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's worth spending the time to avoid dangers because the stuff that's not dangerous kind of takes care of itself. Right. Like that's the majority of the experience, of course. And Absolutely. so it's just like, all right, maybe I need to spend 80% of my time thinking about how to not slip and fall on ice and, you know, whatever, take care of that. Okay. How to not freeze to death. And I, all right, I've got a good system for that. Yep. And then the rest of it's just like, just do your thing. Just walk North. <laughs> totally. Totally. And it's like a super pleasant experience. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And so. uh, I, I like what you said, like, you just don't need, you, you don't need as much as you think. And it, and it's not a sacrifice. I really like your, liked your point about that, because <laughs> I think that's true about more than just going on long, long walks in the woods. There's a lot, there's a lot that you don't need. So you, totally. so you do, uh, we can talk about the PCT all day and I have, I probably have some more questions about, about hiking, but just for the sake of the narrative, I want to get through yeah. a couple more things. So you do the PCT in 2016, you do it in 99 days, which, uh, for people listening, I think the average is like five months. Like yeah. More, I was probably doing about twice the speed of most people. Yeah. Um, 
made it actually hard to hike with anyone because uh I'm gonna ask you yeah. very few people were going my pace <laughs> did you find that um did you find that like was that a bummer for you that like you didn't have a you didn't have a a, a posse or a group of friends that you were kind of going with or was that a, a benefit it was fine because i i was very much looking for a solo experience um i i actually did hook up with um, a few other hikers for sh very short periods of, of time, but, uh, and, and became good friends with them. And that time we were together and really enjoyed it, but I was looking for a solo experience. So I wasn't going out of my way to slow down or speed up or whatever, just to be with people. Yeah. I just kind of wanted to do my thing. Sure. Well, you got You got to hike your own hike as they say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so 2016, you get off, mm -hmm. you, you get off the PCT. What's your move? Mm -hmm. Because 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 you you had the engineering job you didn't like yep. AT. Then you yep. had home energy retrofit job that was yep. a better fit, but it went bankrupt. So you yep. did the PCT. Yep. It's 2016. What's next? This is the yeah. This is the beginning of the modern era. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think of my life in different stages. I'm sure everyone does based on these like big things that happen to you, right? And for me, it's like college was transformative you know kind of developed my ideals and beliefs my first engineering job at second job pct and now the modern era <laughs> so when i got back from the pct i would have loved to have kept hiking forever and i was getting kind of deeper into the hiking culture and learning about people who basically become like chronic hikers <laughs> you know maybe maybe they work a job for half the year and then hike the other half of the year yeah kind of support that lifestyle or whatever one of my friends who i met on the pcta he actually kind of ended up doing that for like the next five years um but i wanted i for me i, I realized at that point like i needed to i wanted to have like a more robust kind of long-term financial plan like what what am i doing here with my <laughs> life like this is fun but am i just going to keep doing this hamster wheel of like hiking and working and hiking and working forever yeah. i mean which seems fun but like what do you do after that um so this is when i kind of got serious about working to become financially independent and that has been kind of the predominant force of my energy for the past seven years i had kind of always known about i I'd, I'd always been pretty good at like personal finance and you know i paid off my debt really quick i read personal finance blogs and that kind of thing um i think i i knew kind of about this idea of like saving for your future so you could retire early or live a different kind of life um but i wasn't i wasn't hooked on it yet and and I kind of knew about these ideas all throughout like the hiking years and all that. But in 2016, I came back, I got another job um, kind of in this home energy retrofit space, um, but actually as a, it's like a, this, this is a government program that I worked in. And um, I was kind of like a, an inspector working on like the government side of it at this point. Yeah. Um, making sure all the contractors were doing a good job. Yeah, so the homeowners uh, gets gets the grant or money or, or yeah. however the program works. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I was kind of working on that side of it. So I got this decent job. Um, it was pretty easy. It was kind of like on the road. I would just drive around to different job sites, check in on different projects, make sure that the contractors were installing things properly. I would say I liked it. You know, it was fun. I was out of the office. It was kind of a blue collar job, but like an easy one. Like I just kind of looked at stuff and used my knowledge to say like that looks good. Um, yeah. Or that looks bad, um, and it it paid okay, you know, not still less actually than I was making as a real engineer, but it paid pretty good. And I kind of learned about I learned about some of the big financial independence blogs at that time. I got big into like Mr. Money Mustache. I later learned about Early Retirement Extreme, Jacob Long Fisker, and um, just kind of went in the deep end of saving for my future. <laughs> I kind of went back to, well, I was lucky in that I never had lifestyle creep. Yeah. Like all through these years, I never went beyond living like I did as a college student. I lived with roommates. I had cheap rent. I always seeked out cheap rent. I never had a fancy car. I never bought things 
fancy things, you know, yeah. I, I probably had a little bit of lifestyle creep, you know, I went to restaurants and stuff like that, but like nothing bad. <laughs> um, so I was pretty much able to save over 50% of my income from my job. And I just, you know, just tried to increase that over time, saving as much as I could. I, I knew that I wasn't the, the, the work that I was doing. I knew I didn't want to do it forever. Yeah. And it was, this was primarily driven by like, you know, I, I don't know what I want to do in the future, but I know it's not this. So yeah, I mean, I saved pretty hard for, I don't know, five years. And then I, I started a, a side hustle, which has now become like my full, my, my full self-employed business. When I came back from the PCTA, sorry, the PCT, I wanted to maintain the sense of adventure mm -hmm. that I got from the PCT in hiking. Um, but I wasn't really sure how to do it, like within the constructs of a normal 40 hour a week full time job. I ended up getting into running and becoming a runner, which was a new thing for me. Mm. That was a way for me to, I guess, channel my physical energy, my sense of adventure of like going out and running and exploring. I started entering races and, you know, being competitive through my running and pushing myself and trying to become as good of a runner as I could kind of became my, you know, my thing after the PCT. Like mm. I would love to go on another long through hike right now, but, and, and I do go on weekend ones. Um, but it's hard to do that when you're holding down like a full-time job and living where I live. I don't live in a place right now that has, I've hiked everything around here. Yeah. But running is like a little taste of that adventure every day. You know, mm. I can go out for an hour run and I can run to a local trail um, or go do a track workout and push myself really hard. And I can get that, you know, small bite size chunk of, you know, physical activity, movement through space, pushing myself, working towards a greater goal. Uh, so running kind of became my thing. Yeah. I started a, I started a run coaching business a couple of years ago and, um, you know, I, I hired, so when I signed up for my first marathon, I, I wanted to train for it the right way, because if I was going to go through the effort of doing it, you know, I wanted to learn how to train like an athlete and do it properly and not just like make it up and do terrible. So I hired a coach. She taught me how to, how to train the right way. And I, I improved a ton. I really enjoyed the experience. And um, she, she ended up quitting coaching. She didn't do it for very long, but um, you know, the experience, I loved it. And I was like, you know, I think I could help other people the same way too. Mm -hmm. So I started coaching. I kind of emulated my style off of what she shared with me and how she taught me. And that was in 2019 while I still had this, this, inspector role for energy efficiency projects. Yeah. And I, you know, I started off coaching just like a few people, a couple of friends, and um, then some of them started paying me to do it. Uh, and then I just, you know, kind of grew that on the weekends, um, nights, that kind of thing. I would do a lot of promotion online and in my local running community, try to get more people who wanted to be coached by me. And as my athletes started to have more and more success. I would share their results and show that online. Other people started to see, um, and it just kind of snowballed and grew and grew and grew. In 2020, COVID obviously happened. And then in 2021, um, I got to this point where I had a crossroads to take <laughs> with my, my life. All through COVID, I had been working from home and working from home for my, my corporate job. And I loved that. I never, I never liked going to an office. Even when I, even when I liked the job and, and I rarely liked the job, but even when I liked the job, I never liked, <laughs> I never liked going to the office. Yeah. Like that was like, I, I just want, I, I wanted to work from, I want to work remotely. That's what I want yeah. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my company was starting to do make rumblings of like, okay, we're going to bring people back to the office. This was conveniently a time where my my personal run coaching business was starting to take off, do pretty well. I had gotten up to, oh, I don't know, fifteen clients or something at that point. I wasn't making a ton amount of ton of money. I think I was making 
just a little over 2000 a month from my rent coaching, but it was enough to cover my living expenses. Yeah, you know, I kind of went through some like a rough thing with work, realized I, I you know, I, I knew I didn't want to work that much longer, but the opportunity presented itself to take my run coaching full time. My company wanted to bring us back to the office. I knew I didn't want to go. Like <laughs> setting foot back was going to be a total personal failure for me to yeah. like have to go back there. And um, my business was starting to take off. So yeah, I made the choice to quit my engineering, like my corporate job as an inspector and take my run coaching business full time. And uh, that was in... I think it was in March or April, 2021. So it's coming up on two years now. Nice. Yeah. I've just been doing that full time since, um, running my own business online, coaching, coaching adults, um, to become better road runners, run marathons, half marathons and, and shorter events. And yeah, that's, that's what I do for work now. Uh, and it's, and it's great. It's like the first time in my life that I, that I like what I do. And I feel like it's like fully in line with my values and the life I want to live. So that kind of catches us up to now. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. I love hearing about that. Like, you know, people finding stuff that like, I do what I want to be doing. You know, this isn't a sacrifice what I'm doing. Um, and I, it's, it's interesting that you got into um, running later when I, when I saw that you had done the PCT in 99 days, I was like, oh, well, this mm -hmm. makes sense. This guy's a marathoner. Like clearly he just applied his like marathon being in shape, whatever to the PCT, but like, no, it was the other way around. It was, it was like, you got into running as a way of, of kind of um, getting into and being part of that experience. Totally. Totally. I didn't play any sports when I was in school. You know, I got into biking when I was in college. I lived in Boston, which is a very bike friendly city. So I would bike around and stuff, but you know, I wasn't, no, I wasn't a runner. I wasn't anything, but it, it was a cool way to like, you, yeah, like you said, to just take a little bit of that sense of adventure that I got from doing these long trips into like daily life and stay in touch with that. Yeah. My electrical system is going on the fritz. I don't know exactly why it's doing that. Oh, Normally no. it just like shuts off it's like no, we're <laughs> down here uh but it was flickering which is strange but uh everything's still good here <laughs> is it all um, solar powered there yeah it's all solar panel uh the the closest grid energy system here is like 20 miles away oh, so wow. it's all yeah it's all solar um and i've actually my solar system is on serenity and then i've got it wired out and coming into here uh, uh, so i can't check my inverter at the moment yeah, so you're you're caught up. You got it. You got into running. You've built this business, and you're doing it full time. When did you uh, meet your wife? At what point in the story did that happen? After, so after I got back from the PCTA, I started to get in. Sorry, I keep saying PCTA. That's another thing, and that is a different thing in my life, which is very relevant these days. I'm not going to get into it, but uh, okay. I got back from the PCT, and um, got started to get into running. And I met my wife at a local running club actually. Um, so running was a great way for me to get involved with the community as an adult too. Kind of through this whole story of mine, I, for better or worse, probably mostly worse, I didn't stay in great touch with a lot of like my college friends and, and friends um, in like the early years after college. And running was like a great way to kind of get like reintroduced into a, a community and make friends as a, you know, then 20, 27, 26 year old. So I met, I met my wife there. I, I met a lot of other runners who, you know, spent a lot of good, good times with um, running or getting drinks after the run, that kind of thing. And she was a, she was a runner. She kind of mo helped motivate me to want to get like deeper into it. Cause she had done all these cool things as a runner that I hadn't done yet. Yeah. Uh, we, we, I moved in with her pretty quickly after meeting her. <laughs> Because <laughs> I came, I came home from the PCT, and I like didn't really have a house, you know. I was just yeah. crashing with friends, renting with friends, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and I'm really thankful that I met her because, uh, you know, I probably had about a year of being being solo and wandering after I came back from the PCT. But uh, then I met her, and um, yeah, it's kind of helped shape my modern life and the trajectory I'm on. I'm definitely a, a family guy now. We had our first kid yeah. uh, eight months ago. Congratulations. So, 
That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, now we're just, we're trying to live well it, 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 on the, on the surface, it probably looks like we're living a pretty traditional family life in kind of a urban suburban urban area. Uh, but we do a lot of things on our own terms, I'm really happy with, I think we've, we've got a good thing going right now. We're really able to just focus on spending time as a family with each other, with our kid. Um, neither of us have work obligations that take us away from what we want to do. We've really been able to structure the work that we do do each week, like around the life we want to live. And it's, it's definitely not perfect and it's definitely still stressful in its own ways, but I'm so happy, you know, the, some of the choices that I made, even when I was like, you know, 19 and started to like pay off my college debt then versus like, you know, buying a new car or something like that or yeah. you know, whatever, like all these choices helped weed to where we are now. Mm. And it's a, it's fun. It's a cool place. <laughs> Is, is your wife uh, as on board with frugality or more on board with frugality than you are? Or like, you know, because uh, one of the most common issues that people have who get into the fire community or if or when they get into radical frugality, whether mm -hmm. they're interested in financial independence or not, mm -hmm. is, you know, if, you're, if your partner, if your life partner is on board with that. So yeah. how is that um, with you guys? Yeah. She's definitely on board with it. She's definitely less um, <laughs> extreme as I as I am and would be if I was, sure. you know, fully by myself. But she's on board. Like she, um, she's definitely frugal, and she's definitely we're working towards the same goals. Mm. Uh, it's just maybe the the pace and the level of aestheticism <laughs> perhaps is a bit different. Um, you know, I think if it was just me. Well, I mean, I can I can tell you when when um, I met her, I lived in an apartment that was like you know no furniture, <laughs> nothing on the walls, like yeah. some hiking gear and like some food, and you know, and now we have a pretty normal house with you know we bought a new couch and we have a kitchen full of way too many plates and stuff like that, <laughs> <laughs> but you know we're we're aligned on the most important things. Yeah, um, that's and important. that's what matters. So you've got this, you've got this side hustle that became your main thing. You were able to let go the co corporate job. You make in excess of your cost of living, yep. um, and you're spending your time doing mostly what you want to do, and you're in alignment with. Do you have like a a target date of like, oh, I'll be financially independent at this point, or? How important is that sort of way of looking at uh, your life? Yeah, this has been a big question for me, actually, over the past two years. Um, something I've been kind of struggling with, like, what's, what's the driving force now with work and with financial accumulation? You know, starting in 2016, when I got serious about saving for the, you know, the concept of financial independence and early retirement. Um, the primary driver was wanting to escape work that I didn't like. That that was the that was the main driver. I mean, it was it was as simple as I hate my job. I hate my job. <laughs> I don't want to do this. How do I get out? I want out. Let's let's save a ton of money. Now uh, it's definitely a lot more complicated. So we are we are not we are not financially independent by let's say like the four percent rule or the twenty five times your annual expenses. We're over. You know, we're it, it depends how you calculate it. We're probably we're over halfway there. We have a lot of we have enough financial cushion and security where I'm not stressed about money. Mm. We need to continue to make an income to you know live the life that we want to live. But I also feel like from my experience living as a hiker and all these things, like you know, if if we wanted to cut our expenses in half tomorrow and you know never work again. <laughs> we could do that. <laughs> you know, if we wanted to move to some off-grid cabin in Maine and then, like we could do that tomorrow and not work again. Um, yeah. But um, I guess right now we are, yeah, I'm still saving investing for the future. Um, there's not really the urgency that there used to be. Um, mm -hmm. I've been able to 
design my life and work where I don't work, don't work more than I really want to. There's definitely aspects of my, my business that I don't love and I don't want to do forever, but there are other parts that I do enjoy and give me personal fulfillment, but I don't know. It's good. I mean, in all honesty, I honesty, I probably work like 20 at 20 hours a week and it's very flexible for the most part on my own schedule. Uh, and I'm, you know, lucky to right now be making more than I've ever made ever at a job. Like, yeah. so I'm probably make like, we're still probably saving over 50% of our income and not working a ton. Uh, but when we are working, doing the work that we love, yeah, I don't know. It's like, I don't really know what's what in some ways I'm like, what's next? Like, what's the point of all this now? Um, yeah. like I'm not motivated to make more. Like, like increasing my income is not a motivator, motivation. Yeah. I don't want to work harder to make more money or like work more to make more money. So like, I've been trying to dial down, like remove the parts of my job that I don't love and just keep the parts that I do love. Some of that's possible now. Some of it's not really. We, so to answer your question, like, I, I guess, yeah, I am. I still want to work towards this like traditional definition of, fire like 25 times your annual expenses, but we don't have a hard date on it. And there's not like the urgency anymore, yeah. but yeah, I'm hoping let's just say in five years, I hope I'm not doing the exact same thing I'm doing now, <laughs> but I <laughs> sure. don't know. I don't know what the path to that's going to look like. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, we, I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but in the, in the communities we're involved in, we talk about uh, two different types of motivation. One is freedom mm-hmm. from, and one is freedom to, right. Yeah. So the traditional, motivation for going fire is freedom from a job that sucks right but now you've got your life arranged such that you you you've got a freedom too you are free to do these things that you largely like to do right which is this business and it's interesting and fun and and your freedom from motivation is decreased because so little relatively about your life sucks which is great and it's also like i can i could see you being like Okay. All right. What are we, <laughs> what, are, what are we doing now? And uh, maybe uh, I'm, I'm wondering what you think about mm-hmm. when someone's invested a lot in pursuing a goal, when some of that motivation either changes, sublimates into something else or goes away, it can be, I don't, I don't know if it's like difficult to maintain, but it's like the, the situation changes, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. In terms mm-hmm. of motivation. Yeah, it does. Um, forces you to think like, wait, what's life about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think that that's been my biggest question for the last couple of years. Um, you know, I think that, uh, so one thing that's been really empowering, and I think this, uh, if I can share a lesson, you know, I think that this is, this has been really helpful is, is learning how to make my own money has mm. been huge. Like mm. so much of the conversation around financial independence is, you know, like you said, this freedom from like, like saving at this work you do for another person to escape and not have to do it anymore. Learning how to make my own money, how to be an entrepreneur and how to um, make a little bit more now than I ever made as an employee before. Learning how to do that was hard. But now that I've learned that, I'm extremely confident that I'm always going to be able to make money. Mm. Uh, I don't know what that's going to look like or what I'm going to want to do because like Mm. what I want to do is different, but I know how to do it now. Like I know how to sell things. I know how to build some kind of a product or service. Often in these conversations around financial independence or just like thinking about your future, planning for the future, like people are just so worried about scarcity and like running out of money or whatever. But like if you can develop the skill to always be able to make money or know mm. how to make money. I mean, I just, I don't worry about that at all anymore. It, it really kind of de-emphasizes the, that milestone, right? Of, oh, I have my safe withdrawal rate is 4% or my stash is 25 X, whatever your, your number is, right? It's like, well, eh, my number is whatever it is, but you know, if, if I need to open the spigot on some money, I know how to do that. And I've got buffers so I can see that moment coming. It's not like, I'm going to be like, oh my God, it's Tuesday on Thursday. I need money and I don't have any, <laughs> right? Totally. It's going to sneak up on you. Totally. Um, so I think like learning that feeling empowered personally, and I think mm. 
for anyone to know, to learn how to make money on their own and not have to do it for somebody else is huge because then it totally changes your relationship with work and employment. Like it's not you working for someone else anymore. It's, you know, you doing your own thing and it's just different. You know, there's also the question of like, I also do like the retire early part of fire. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I think a lot of, many of the conversations now around this subject, people are like, oh, it's not about retiring early. It's just about like gaining this freedom to do what you want to do. And that's true. But I talk about this with my friend, Matt. It's like, my friend Matt will say like, okay, it's like, sure, you like your job, but like, there's nothing else in the world you would rather be doing than <laughs> yeah, that really. thing. And <laughs> you're like, yeah, you know, you're right. Like, yeah, I like, I like my job and I like coaching. And in some life, in some ways, I always see coaching, you know, probably playing some role in my life, but yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to do it forever. Like it'll become boring and in some ways it already has become boring. And it's like, I want to go hike other trails and go on, you know, just hang out and do it. I don't know. For me, like working and having working, it's not like intrinsically good or motivating or whatever. The less I can work, the better. I do want to have some kind of meaningful thing that I do each day and feel like I'm making a difference in the world. But you mentioned that like the freedom too. like now that we've created our life in this way, it's like, what do we want to do? We're definitely still trying to figure that out. Like, what's the right balance of work and fun and, you know, yeah. helping others and community involvement, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's, it's a harder question to answer than I expected. Do you, are, are there any resources or books or people that you're following that you're finding helpful and useful in that process? Yeah. I mean, um, so there's certain people in the, financial independence, retire early space who kind of talk about this, like life after eh, maybe like, this concepts of like life after phi. And yeah, though maybe, t- but, you know, technically we're not phi. I kind of think of ourselves as, you know, I really do. I, I, I am a lurker on the ERE forums. I get a lot of value out of those. I don't post on them, but I, I read them quite a bit. There is a podcast um, called Mile High Phi that I enjoy quite a bit. That's okay. from by um, Doug Cunnington, who's a online marketer guy and um, uh, the guy, the 1500 Days blog guy, uh, Carl Jensen. And they could just kind of talk about like what their life is like now that they, th- they've both been financially independent for a while and like earning money is not necessarily motivation. So like, you know... <laughs> How do you stay motivated? <laughs> what do you do after that? Yeah, I, do, I, do, yeah. I like it. I like listening to people having conversations about these things because I think listening to podcasts for me is really helpful. Just to like hear people talk through like what they're doing and what's interesting to them um, gives me a lot of ideas. But one thing that that we've done that I think has been really helpful is um, my wife and I both started coaching at a local high school. We started coaching track and field and cross country there. And that might be like the best thing we have going right now. It's pretty big commitment. Basically, it's every day we go in the afternoon and coach for a couple hours from like three to five p.m. Oh yeah, coach the team. We've been challenged to learn all these events in track and field that we, we don't we didn't really know before. So like it's technically been challenging. There's game, there's meets and races and stuff. We got to go to a lot, um, but it's really fun. It's it doesn't feel like a job. It doesn't feel like work. It just feels like something we want to do and a way that we can help, you know, kind of be leaders in 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 our community or in a community, and get like the social interaction of spending time with our team and developing them and helping them become better athletes and people and just kind of being involved with the Rhode Island uh, track community as a whole has been really fun. And that's been a cool thing because like we, we do get that it, it is a job in the sense like they do pay us a, a small stipend and stuff, but it's it's not like the money you make isn't worth the time invested. <laughs> like it's yeah, uh, sure. it's basically like volunteering, but they like compensate you a little bit to volunteer. <laughs> yeah, uh, but we love it. And finding that and starting to do that has been like a really good like next thing for us mm. or like purpose like purpose for what we do. So yeah. 
that's kind of how things are going right now. <laughs> I, li- I like that you brought up the word purpose. I've been um, working with the concept of uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, mm-hmm. which I, I want to say that comes from, that mostly comes from um, SDT, self-determination theory, which is, mm-hmm. you know, like um, theory of how people feel fulfilled and things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, three, three, of the, three of the attributes, I, w- I believe the way they frame it is, attributes that are prerequisites for feeling fulfilled having an intrinsic sense of motivation or you got to have autonomy you got to have the sense that like what you're doing is self-directed or you you, it's really in line with your values yeah mastery is is like there's got to be an opportunity to feel like you're good at what you're doing you're competent um you it's not either like way too easy or way too hard and you just totally suck at it and then uh this sense of purpose which also, I've, I've, I've heard that instead of purposely use the word relate, relatedness, which is like you feel related to other people. And so it's really like, is there much of a difference between purpose and relatedness? Because purpose is typically, we typically feel that in sense to our relation to other people, right? Yeah. Sports coaching for us has really been that. And in particular, coaching our high school team, our girls, like it's ticked all those boxes. Um, my, my own personal business is great, but it's, it's virtual coaching. Like it's online based. So some of my athletes are local and I know them in person and I see them occasionally, but like, I, I don't meet up with them on a regular basis. And that's not the point of my business. Like I pur- purposely built an online based remote right. coaching business, but the coaching experience is very different than being there in person it, with the athlete, you know, every day and actually physically seeing them advance and work on the things that they're doing and you know all that stuff and yeah it's been super it's been super rewarding i think um it's been a great like post financial independence thing to do <laughs> um because the only like we couldn't do it unless we were financially independent the only people who are sports coaches for, for high school, you know, pretty much are business owners or teachers because they're the right. only people who have the schedule that allows for it. Yeah. But as business owners now, you know, we can do whatever schedule we want to do. And though our business, you know, our business is our by and large, it's our main source of income. Uh, we don't really look at high school coaching as, a, you know, a major source of income, though, though it's nice that it's a small one we're just able to do it. Like we've created a life that allows us to spend six days. <laughs> it's, a, it's a ton of time, six days a week <laughs> for these girls. And I get to go spend five hours with them tonight because they have a, a big meet tonight. And just most, most people can't and won't, wouldn't want to do it. But for us, it, it is rewarding and it hits, you know, it, it's the social interaction. It's the challenge, um, sense of purpose. Like we're a team working towards this unified mm. goal. It's, cool and it's the first thing that i've done in a long time probably since college that like wasn't motivated by the desire to make money Mm. um and that's kind of cool to to be there like because i remember back in my college days i was involved with political activism you know i would go to group meetings i would be in protests all these sort of all these sorts of things and social interaction that um you know, was for a, a mission or for a goal, but the the point of it wasn't to personally make money. <laughs> I definitely wasn't making money by being an activist uh, in college, and and you know, all through my twenties, you know, pretty much everything I did was, you know, with the exception of like the trips and stuff, the hikes. It was, yeah, you know, how do I make money to provide for myself? Um, but now, being a high school coach, it's it's like this is what I want to do. This is like actually what I want to do right now. Um, so it's been really cool to, to figure that out. And um, I don't know what, you know, we're, we're not going to do it forever. We'll probably take a break, but, you know, we're only, I'm only 34. A lot of coaches are much older. So it's yeah. always something we could come back to. Like it could be a great job when we're in our 50s or 60s or 70s. Um, it's a great job now, but um, it'll always be there. Like the opportunity will always be there. Um, and we're enjoying it now while we're, while we have it. Yes. <laughs> that's how things are right now. <laughs> that That's really cool. That's really, uh, 
gratifying to hear. And I'm really curious to, uh, to see where you go from here. So like definitely stay in touch. I want to see, I want to, I want to be able to, to hear, you know, what the next, uh, phases are, you know, whenever that happens. Thank Um, you. It's really, it's really cool to see people who are, who have done the work to get themselves free early. And then it's like, yeah, you're 34, you're young, you've got energy. Um, I also find it so cool to hear of parents, particularly of young children who are doing this place is like, you're going to be able to be there in, in a way, like in, in a way that many people can't just because you've got so much freedom over your, your schedule, you, you know, you can be like, Oh, Hey, right now, whatever, maybe, maybe you've got something going on. Maybe you're doing a coaching business and you're like, look for these years, we're just going to shut this down. Yep. And I'm just going to be there hundred percent or whatever, you yep. know, whatever balance. Right. Um, I think that's totally like- that was a huge motivator, you know, it- I really, I really like a lot of the stuff that, that Mr. Money Mustache has put out over the years. I like his whole mentality. And, you know, I think one of the, his early posts was like, he wanted to work really hard when he was young and save and invest so that when he had a family, he could be there hundred percent for the family. And, um, I really took that to heart and wanted to do that too. So like, yeah, that's where we're at now. Like, I feel so lucky you know, but neither me nor my wife need to, you know, have a full-time job or have a job we don't want to have. Um, and we can just be there with our kid, which is cool. It's really cool. It's also challenging in its own ways to, to be yeah. with your kid all the time, but, um, I wouldn't want it any other way. And, um, I'm happy we did it that way. And yeah, the future, I have no idea. I have no freaking clue what we're going to do. <laughs> like, it's cool. It's so, it's so totally open-ended, mm. totally open-ended but I have no idea where we're going to go or what we're going to do. I, I wanted to tell you, you said that uh, activism, you don't make any money with the activism stuff. A contraire, sir. Uh, yeah. You're just doing it wrong. So, <laughs> How did you make money? So I was, uh, I, I mentioned in our email that I, I was uh, hanging out with the Occupy Oakland folks mm-hmm. where, where the office was. Like kitty corner across the block was the Occupy Oakland encampment. Like we could look out the window and see, yep. you know, the plaza full of tents. Um, and so long story short, I, I kind of got involved with them. And in uh, near the end of Occupy Oakland, it was uh, end of January, 2012. There was a big action during the day and I showed up and we ran around and I think we were trying to take over a building or something like mm-hmm. that. And it kind of petered out. And so I, I was like, all right, seems like things are kind of done here. I went home. Then I was following along on Twitter and it was like, stuff's going on. Like the cops are tear gassing people's like, Oh, I got to get back down there. So I get, I get on my bike, I ride back down and it's I like, I chain my bike up. It's funny. Like there's the mass of occupiers running and mm-hmm. they're being chased by like a hundred cops or something like that. I mean, yeah. they're being followed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. I'm trying to catch up to my friends. And so I like, I run through the crowd of police to get up with the, <laughs> The group of people um we wound up getting kettled so yeah. that you know they block up a street there's 450 of us wow yep they they arrest all of us it's like they they had to commandeer city buses to to put people on because they ran mm-hmm. out of jail buses or whatever anyway mm-hmm. so you know spend uh that was saturday night i was released uh monday morning around 3 a.m you know, we were just in like the drunk tank and it took them a long time to process people up. Mm-hmm. Not a big deal. Just hanging out in a concrete room with a bunch of friends, right? Several months later, I get an email from the ACLU and it was like, yeah, that was an illegal, the the the, the arrest had been conducted illegally. Wow. Uh, on a technicality, right? Yeah. And so the ACLU sued, uh, cl- uh, brought a class action lawsuit and... <laughs> Everyone who got arrested there, who, who didn't wind up getting a felony for, you know, something else, um, yeah. got a check for $3,000. Oh my God. So in a sense of, <laughs> so in a sort of poetic justice, I, I, my last payment on my student loans, I made with that check from the Alameda Whoa. County Sheriff's Department. That is, that is awesome. <laughs> so is just so throwing cool. it out there, just some ideas for how to, you can make money off of activism, um, <laughs> totally accidentally, but, uh. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that was that. That was and that today. That was the highest um, uh, hourly wage I've ever made. Wow, good job. I um, was always, I was too chicken to get arrested. I would hang out until uh, 
the cops showed up and then I would, I would ride my bike away from there <laughs> rather than towards it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good idea. I mean, I was, I was standing like a couple people over from, um, a guy who got hit, uh, shot in the forehead with, uh, allegedly a tear gas canister, but uh. turns out it was probably a bean background, which implies that it, it wasn't a bad bounce. It was someone pointed a shotgun at this guy's head and yeah. put a beanbag in it and shot him. And he had like, uh, you had to relearn how to talk and stuff like that. Yeah. But, um, that was a crazy time. And, and, crazy and time. <laughs> yeah. And you were in, uh, no, you were finishing up school then, right? Yeah. I, uh, I remember the day of my high school graduation. I, um, no, not high school. Sorry. The day of my college graduation, yeah. I <laughs> left it and um, like, I got my diploma and had my cap and gown or whatever. And then I immediately went to Occupy Boston from my graduation <laughs> <laughs> to, to Occupy Boston. Um, and like, yeah, those were the, the, the final days of my, my activism life conversation for another time, I think, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I actually haven't since those days, I haven't actually had a conversation with someone who was also involved in it. And I've, I've always, it's always been challenging to have conversations, to try to have conversations with people about it, uh, who, who weren't involved, didn't kind of get it. You know, people be like, oh, what did you accomplish? Or like, what were you trying yeah. to do there? And it's like, I don't really have a good answer for you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, yeah. I think, I think for me, as my, you know, as I've kind of, I'm going to say grown up, but I don't mean grown up to say that everything I did there was immature, but yeah. Now I just try to lead life a lot more by example, I mm. think, or I try to embody like the life, the values I want for the world and try to, I guess, lead by example and just, you know, yeah, get involved with positive things that I want uh, for the world. Maybe that's my form of activism now. I, I, I haven't really actually told this full story like this before, like mm. on a podcast or anything, but, um, uh, I like talking about it and uh, like we were chatting about earlier, like, yeah, now that I'm in this place where I feel like we're now in this place where it's like, yeah, the freedom to do stuff we want to do. Mm. It's been a real, like, not, not a bad problem to have. It's a good problem to have, but it's like, okay, what's next? Like, you know, like the trajectory of life as it's laid out for you is pretty defined, you know, it's like, yeah the whole like high school college career work 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 a family of kids and it's like we kind of jumped off we kind of jumped off of the that after the college career jumped off that <laughs> now we're on this other path now we have kids yeah but like there's no just it's not just work for 30 years now and then retire it's like the rest of our life <laughs> the rest of our life is kind of our retirement from corporate work now yeah and it's like okay what's that gonna look like i don't know having a kid go ahead oh having a kid has been great though because um now we can see the world through her eyes and mm. it's opened up the ability to do so many things that as you know adults you can't really do or it would be awkward to do <laughs> <laughs> Like now, you know, now I can spend a day going to the playground with my kid or take, <laughs> taking her to um, like a petting zoo or something like just going to community festivals and all that sort of stuff that just as, you know, as, as 30 or 30 year old couple maybe isn't like, isn't really a great thing to do or you wouldn't do, but <laughs> it's like, she's, she's your access. It's like, oh, they're fine. They're, they're, they're with her. <laughs> yeah yeah um and now uh, yeah so i don't know yeah it's it's uh, i think jacob's talked about this a fair amount on the forum which is that you know there's there's sort of off the shelf life scripts that you, that people can just take down you know like you said they worked for 30 years after college mm -hmm. and blah 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 but when you get off script you have to write your own script and it's like oh this is a whole thing i I should think about this or this is worth a lot of attention 
to yeah. write this the way the way I want to write it. And it's not at all, I think, the case that one ought to write like, oh, okay, this is what the next 30 years of my life is going to look like. It can just be it can be a year at a time, a day at a time. Yeah. What I found, too, is like as as I gain more experience and competency with things, too, like in some ways that makes my decisions of what I want to do more challenging or like 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 for example if you have all this free time there's just endless things you could fill the free time with like one thing is I could learn how to play guitar but like I can almost envision like how would that go like I could spend all this time learning how to play guitar enjoy it a little bit and then in like six months to a year it's just kind of like a dead end <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then it's like okay then what am I gonna do it's like, okay, I can learn how to garden. Like we used to have a garden. We don't have one anymore. I guess, I guess everything you do is kind of, at least I found this, it kind of has like a, like a lifespan or a, a, mm. a shelf life. Like every hobby I've had, I've really enjoyed for let's say three to five years. And then I got tired of it. And then I need to like, what's the next thing? Yeah. Um, and again, it's like a good problem to have when your life is like open-ended and you're trying to think like, okay, what's the next thing you're going to get into? <laughs> yeah. Like, where is this going to go? Is this going to go where I want it to go? Or is it just going to be like something I do for a little while and then put down? I don't know. Interesting things to think about. Yeah. And I, I think that when you're, it's like, there's the traditional life path and then there's the traditional fire path, which is like work a traditional career until you hit your number and then you're done. Um, and then there's what you're, you're doing, which is, you know, different still from that because, mm -hmm. um, you're not five, but you're working on this, this, your own business and stuff, but what you envision when you're white knuckling something and you've got mm -hmm. your mostly freedom from, right. You're like, Oh, it is going to be so great. Not doing this thing that I don't like. Yep. And then, but, but, but then what, what you, your vision of what it is that you are doing can be very, um, it's, a, it's all in your head. It's all theoretical, right? Mm -hmm. you can be like, oh, I'm going to do guitar. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. It's going to be amazing. I'll sit on a beach or, you know, whatever that vision is. But then when you start to do that, it's like, okay, it's not Instagram. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's like, there's, there's, I'm, I'm awake for 16 hours a day. I fill it with stuff. And the reality of it is, is like, it always is. It's different than what you imagine it to be. And then, so as you start getting experience doing, living a self-directed life, mm -hmm. then that becomes, um, I think a lot more complex and, and, and rich, I think, uh, which is both good, but also, you know, like you're saying, it's like, it's, it's a whole thing. Yeah. It's a nice opportunity though, to be presented with these choices, like to have these choices. Yeah. It's not it, like, I mean, I guess things would just be boring if there was a obvious path of what to do next <laughs> right so it's a good problem good problem to have to have like this totally open-ended future chris this has been an amazing conversation i'm really glad that you reached out so that we could have this is there first of all if if people want to check out your stuff check out your your coaching business if they're interested in that uh, how should people try to track you down on the internet if at all yeah so um well, everything I have online is through my coaching business. So if you're if you're interested in running, um, I have a lot of great resources. Some of them are free. Like I wrote a book on how to train for a marathon, and you can download a free copy of that from my website. Uh, my website is nightandruns.com. And then I also have uh, training plans and coaching services if you're interested in, in becoming a better runner. I do a podcast too, the Night and Runs podcast. So each week I talk about different aspects of, of running on there. And that's pretty much it. Aside from my running persona, I don't really do anything online. <laughs> but if you are interested in becoming a better runner, check it out at nightandruns.com. Okay, so to wrap up, I just wanted to pull out a couple threads that I really uh, like that I got out of my conversation with Chris. So a couple points. Uh, he never had much lifestyle creep. I think that's important. That relates to an idea that I'll talk about in a second that uh, he didn't make very many mistakes. He didn't make big mistakes such as, you know, he mentioned uh, he, he never like bought a big car. He never like got into a lot of debt. Um, so uh, I think a lot of success comes not, 
success comes from both making good choices, but it also comes very much from not making bad choices. Like you can be in a very good place if you simply avoid making bad choices. And like, I don't see any of those in Chris's life, <laughs> or at least in the story that he shared with us, right? Like he, um, from a, from a sort of personal, um, freedom perspective, he made very few, uh, if any, um, bad choices. It seemed like he, he didn't make any large ones. All right. Uh, but so a key dynamic here is that he had the courage for whatever re reason to say, this sucks, I'm going to do something different and do a pattern interrupt. You know, he did that with his through hikes. And then because of those experiences, he had a real taste that, oh, life could be different, right? So we had this idea, mm, I'm not really into this. Let me try something else, something really different. And he did that. And then that experience that he had informed his decision making about what he would then do with the rest of his life like his next step right so my idea of chris's story is that his adventures and his explorations of the world which took courage and a bit of risk helped him to define and refine his why his vision what he wanted and then the methodology of fire and ere helped him to achieve that he's now currently doing something he finds really meaningful and enjoyable he's building a family uh, you know, he's not stressed from his job. He's not overly stressed from his job. And, um, you know, another theme that arises from his story is that Chris's answers didn't come all at once. It wasn't an instantaneous thing that they evolved over time. And, and they're still continuing to evolve. You know, we left off with him talking about, um, you know, not knowing what comes next, but knowing that it's not going to be, you know, it, in five years, it's going to be different than where he is right now, for sure. But to get to the point that he's at now, which is quite a good place, it, it was years and years of searching and experimenting and trying different things. He knew in his second year of college, he didn't really want to be an engineer. And, and his first engineering job doubly confirmed that, but it got him, uh, but it got, got him to pay his loans off. So, okay, check. And, you know, and then he goes and hikes the AT. Um, and that in so he tries another company that's not so evil corpy and he's got more freedom now, right? Because he has no debt, it has basically no money, but he doesn't have any debt. So he's not really under the gun. And so he tries another company that maybe is a better fit. And he's like, all right, well, this still isn't great. And so when that company goes under, he's like, all right, <laughs> I need another adventure on the PCT. And I, I think it's important to note um, that his PCT hike, unlike his AT, was a solo hike. Um, lots and lots of, well, 99 days to be precise, days of um, of just thinking his own thoughts and reflection and introspection, right? And so my, my sense is that as he finishes the PCT, he's got he's getting an even clearer sense of what he wants, or, or at least the shape of what he wants. And so he gets a job that's, you know, maybe even slightly better than the last one, but it, it's just fine. It's nothing magical, but it's also not super stressful. Uh, but it's at this point that he gets really into the praxis of financial independence. So frugality, saving, investing, all these other things. Uh, and it's here, it's here that he picks up running. And, and this is... This is the thread that I think connects it. It's like he, these jobs are things that he's like, ah, I'm not really into this. Let me go have some adventures. His adventures inform his choice of jobs, but it also informs his choice of what to do with his life. So he gets into running as a form of uh, kind of continuing on that sense of adventure and personal challenge that he experienced on his through hikes. And he really enjoys it. He, he gets really competent at it, right? That's a key thing. He, he gets very skilled at running. And so he, he, he's able to leverage that into a side hustle. And eventually when his circumstances change, he's able to elevate that side hustle into his full gig. So now he's, he is, he's a business owner. He's his own boss. He calls the shots. He's making more money than he ever has. And a lot of that came out of, it came out of the freedoms afforded to him from this frugality practice, from lifestyle design, from thinking through what it was he really wants in these adventures. So I think his story is really interesting because of how it sort of paints a, like a realistic picture, right? Like there's, there's nothing earth shattering, like, like Chris is not running SpaceX or something like that. You know, it's like not a crazy story, but it's just how to put it. It's like, here's a guy who didn't screw up. There's a guy who didn't make mistakes and he 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 had this sort of doggedness to follow his his values and his north star. He had the sense of a north star. He said he's always had it and he really developed it during his college years and he's for the last decade coming up on decade and a half now he's been following 
this sense that he's got within himself of like, I want something that's not this. So I'm going to keep moving and I'm going to keep searching and I'm going to keep working. And he was, you know, it takes a lot. I mean, like the ability to, to complete a through hike, just, just though that bit of information right there, this guy's finished the AT and he finished the PCT. Those are, that speaks highly to his character, his perseverance, his dedication. It's a very small percentage of people who actually finish, of those who start, of the people who even get to the point of starting. Uh, he finished and not, not that many people uh, finish. And then, you know, to do it in 99 days is kind of nuts. But, th- but then, of course, you know, he gets into running and he, and he also displays, like, the ability to work really hard and learn uh, and, and develop his skills and his competence. And he's able to leverage that into, like, oh, this is what I do now. This is more aligned. So... Something that I liked about Chris is that while he didn't like his job, his response to his job was not, I'm just gonna like crawl into a little hole within this company and cruise by and skate and then hit my FI number and quit. I know that's a popular story and everyone's got to do their own thing and I don't like that story. I like that he 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 kept searching and hustling and finding something else that wasted less of his life. I like that quite a lot. And I think that's an important theme here. For me, something I think that now that I'm talking about it, that's resonating with me is that Chris, Chris didn't take this sucks as the final answer. Or even as like, well, this sucks, but I'm just going to white knuckle through it. He's like, no, like, okay, this is this is what I can do right now, but I'm going to keep working and I'm going to keep looking for something else. I'm going to be making decisions and I'm going to be working on my life. And I really respect that quite a lot. Another thing to point out, he also, he mentions himself how it looks from the surface like they're living a pretty traditional, you know, urban, suburban family life. But under the surface, there's a level of values, alignment, freedom, security, and resilience that is far from traditional. You know, it's far from normal, unfortunately, but kudos Chris and his wife are pulling that off for their family. And that, that's something you see a lot. That's something that Jacob's talked about is the fact that you don't have to look like a weirdo. And I've said this before, like my life looks really weird. Uh, and that's because I really like uh, having a weird life, uh, but it doesn't have to like <laughs> all, all these, this post-consumer praxis that I talked to, you don't have to have a weird looking life. And that's one of the reasons why I want to have people like Chris on because uh, looking weird isn't a value for Chris, but having a life that is built the way he wants it. His life is on his terms and you can have a life that is on your own terms and it can look from a, sh- from a quick glance, right? From far away, it can look, oh, that's that, that looks like a normal family, like a normal life. Um, but there's a lot more going on beneath the surface than there is in, in most typical houses. Okay, I think final point. So Chris, Chris is at this point in his life right now, 2023, Chris has essentially won the game of finding work that you find enjoyable. And he's got, he's got a massive amount of financial security. I mean, halfway to household, financially independent. You know, he's not stressed about money. So he's, he's kind of won that game. And he's got his mind turned to larger questions of what life is about. What does he want to do with the rest of his life? And it took getting to this point, um, it required getting out of those situations that he didn't like so much to get to the point where he was free to think about that, right? Like, it's very difficult to have productive thinking about what life is for and what your life specifically is for when you're not free, when you don't have a bucket of freedom, when you don't have that cash to say, like, you know what, I just need some time and space to think and introspect and experiment. If you don't have that freedom, it's very difficult to have a productive uh, uh, conversation with yourself or with your partner about that sort of thing. Um, but he's, he's put in the work and dedicate, he and his wife has put in the, the work and the dedication to get to that point, And now they're able to wrestle with it. And I don't think the answers are easy to that, uh, for, for anyone, or for some people it might be easy, but for most people, that's a, the question of what life is about takes a lot of effort. Like it is a difficult question to wrestle with. And, so part of the beauty of post-consumer practice and attaining your own freedom is delivering your life to a position where you are able to productively wrestle with that question for yourself and not be stressed and not be overworked and not be um, shackled by needing to work something that's kind of soul-sucking, right? 